Turn back the sands of time to the age of the Egyptian pharaohs, when generations of men built tombs and temples that became wonders of the world, and the names of Nefertiti and Tutankhamun bywords for beauty. Priceless treasures assured their immortality. But the ancient Egyptians left us another, more ordinary but no less valued legacy. For they created beer. The story of the pharaoh's liquid gold lies deep within Egypt's monuments. Etched into the chambers that held mummified kings and courtiers are hieroglyphs of their servants. They're carrying out their everyday duties, including brewing. Beer was part of the staple diet of the ancient Egyptians, so important that written on papyrus is a description of a whole army that fell sick when the beer ran out and they had to drink the water. For 355 days a year, Jim Merrington is a grey-suited executive at Scottish and Newcastle Brewery. The rest of the time, he's a man with a mission. His quest is to discover exactly how the ancient Egyptians made beer, its taste and the potency of the drink that sustained a civilization 3,000 years ago. With his colleague Peter Bolt, he intends to recreate the drink of the pharaohs. Their venture has brought them to the deserts of Egypt in pursuit of a dream that's not far short of the Holy Grail. This is Ty's tomb, which once was buried in sand beside the oldest stone building in the world. This is the earliest known recorded brewing sequence that there is in existence. It's about 4,300 years old. Mm. It's a whole brewery. I mean, right, straight, right from the top where they're actually making the vessels, through the process of um, putting, sparging the material through a sieve and into, into lower vessels, taking it along even further into containers. And there's a possibility of putting yeast into those jars. And then also filling, cupping, and away. The temperatures out here, they would have fermented very quickly. See, that's a what makes it difficult to no. interpret this is that it uh, doesn't read left to right it, or top to bottom. No. It appeared to have to jump about to different places to pick up the sequence of the process. That's right. The sequence is difficult in actual fact. I mean, there probably parts of the process that weren't very interesting were simply missed out. Yeah. You can see that. Being Egyptologists also found sealed in tombs models of servants. Ancient Egyptians believed they would accompany the pharaohs to a supernatural realm, serving them exactly as they did on Earth, bakers making bread, brewers beer. What's missing from these homebrew kits for the life hereafter are the ingredients and the recipe for beer. For that information, the 20th century brewers have had to follow the Nile much farther south. In remote villages, families live today much as their ancestors did. In mud brick houses, they use the tools and raw materials of their forefathers. Families descended from one of the most sophisticated cultures in history live at subsistence level. There's little health care, limited supplies of running water and sporadic electricity. Illiteracy is common, so stories of their ancestors have passed through generations through word of mouth. The village of Haj Kandil lies on the edge of the site of an ancient city now covered by sand. Three and a half thousand years ago, this arid desert was transformed into a thriving new city by the king Akhenaten. He set up his court here with his wife Nefertiti and their children, including their son Tutankhamun. Today, the dust of ages covering their city is slowly being cleared by the Egypt Exploration Society. 
archaeologists are concentrating on Nefertiti's Sun Temple and the bakeries and breweries which supplied it. Scottish and Newcastle Brewery has been helping with the excavation costs after the director of the dig, Barry Kemp, contacted them. Well, until the reign of Akhenaten, and that's until about 1350 BC, the site was an empty stretch of desert. Nobody lived here. But then, in the fourth year of the king's reign, he decided to choose an entirely new place uh, where he could pursue the cult of his sun god, the Aten. And we know from the boundary tablets that were cut in the fourth year of his reign in the cliffs that he came here feeling that he was being led by his god to a place which would be forever sacred to the god. And he set out his intentions to build a series of temples and palaces, a tomb for himself and also tombs for his priests and courtiers, not only were there the temples and palaces that he wanted, but a city of mud brick houses which must have contained 40, 50,000 people. It would have been a place of great contrasts. It started off as a place just of desert, much more desert looking than nowadays. Um, but within it, there would have been quite quickly created gardens and plantations of trees, pools of water, but surrounded by the duller tones of mud brick houses ranging from the houses of the rich down to the hovels, the shanty towns of the poor. After 17 years, Akhenaten's reign ended. No one knows how he died, but there was an attempt to systematically erase all trace of him from the history of the pharaohs. His statues were defaced, his temples destroyed and his city abandoned. Little was built or cultivated here from that time to this. So the archaeologists are excavating a time capsule. Almost everything unearthed here dates back to the days of Nefertiti and Tutankhamun. Delwyn Samuel is learning about the food and drink of their people by examining plant remains and residues in pots. This container has just been discovered. For Dave Wicks from Middlesbrough, it's the find of a lifetime. We found the pot um, after removing some earthen floors of a, a room which is built as part of the bakery complex or brewery complex um, in Arkenarton's enclosure at Komalnana. Um, We've actually got a huge storage vessel which has been sunk through the, the mud brick floor of, of the room. It hasn't actually um, produced any exciting remains at the moment. That There is a small black deposit in the bottom of the pot which may yet turn out to be the residues of something quite interesting for our environmental specialists. Presumably it's a, a, some sort of storage vessel. It's, it's the actual contents which we're interested in now and hopefully Delwyn can actually put something into it which is uh, hopefully beer. <laughs> As well as residues from pots, Delwyn also finds clues about beer thousands of years ago by washing the soil. Light organic fragments of grain, fruit or vegetables left by the inhabitants of Amarna float on the surface. They're separated, dried and later identified under a microscope. I'm looking at how ancient Egyptians made uh, beer and bread and I'm looking at that because they were the staple items of diet and they were both made with cereal remains hence the interest in the plants so I'm looking at remains like the grains of, of cereal and the bits of chaff from cereal but I'm also looking at the kinds of pots that the beer may have been made in and the bread may have been baked in I'm looking at residues of actual bread and beer because in a dry climate like this where Amarna is these organic remains preserve very well and can be studied. Hi, you made it. 
The quest for the beer of the pharaohs has led Jim and Peter to the archaeologists' dig house for an exchange of information. The archaeologists can now answer some of their questions about the ingredients used, and the brewing experts can keep the archaeologists straight on what's possible or impossible in any brewing process. Results at the dig are beginning to raise hopes that ancient beer could be recreated. The main ingredients were obviously water and cereal. Now the ancient Egyptians had two different kinds of cereals. One was barley, which is used today and is the main brewing cereal used today. The other one was something called emmer wheat. Now it's a kind of wheat, but it's quite different kind of wheat that we use today. This is the kind of wheat that the ancient Egyptians preferred to grow and to use, and therefore they had a whole series of steps that they had to go through to clean their grain. And we can find the equipment that they needed to use in the archaeology, in the houses of the people. We've seen the little houses of individual families and they had their mortar where they pounded the emmer wheat to shred away the chaff and they had in almost every house a cornstone where they ground the grain into flour. It's really by trying the actual processes oneself with either the ancient equipment like the real ancient cornstone and replicas of other things like the pestle and try and make the conditions as close as we can and using real emmer wheat that we can see whether the processes we think have been used in the past really do work. This grist is similar to what would be used in brewing, certainly this part of it here without the husk of the grain. So now we think that would be a very good starting point for producing down. a beer. But the two processes has produced a very good brewing material. I think they'd probably have gone for a coarser ground because it would be easier to handle. Mm -hmm. Once you get very fine, like a flour, mm -hmm. you'd have a paste. It would be difficult, difficult to get a liquid down. out of. Right. We're a good way down the track. In fact, we're able now, I think, to be able to produce a base beer and be able to say that by a process, a two two-prong process of treating the materials that uh, we can produce the actual base beer. We then have to go forward from there with more examination and some detailed uh, look at uh, seeds and flowers and, and fruits uh, to determine exactly how the beers were flavoured. Children from the village are recruited to gather fruit, just as they may have done in Tutankhamun's time. Nabak is bitter and of no commercial value. But could it have flavoured beer thousands of years ago? <laughs> Delwyn has found traces of coriander that was used in cooking in the third millennium. Today, it flourishes on ground claimed from the desert by irrigation. The water used to brew the beer will have to have the same chemical balance as this, drawn near wells the ancient Egyptians used. The team has now gathered enough information and samples. It's time for them to cross the Nile and return home for closer analysis of materials. For Delwyn, that means going back to her base at Cambridge University. The National Institute of Agricultural Botany has agreed to help her. She knows emma wheat was used in Egyptian beer, but nowadays it's grown only in remote parts of Western Asia. Handfuls of the grain have been brought to the Institute, which agrees to grow it as an experimental crop, yielding just enough for a viable brew. This is a 
amazing transition. Here's the gelatinized starch, and right next to it. Meanwhile, Leica Cambridge is letting Delwyn use their state-of-the-art scanning electron microscope, SEM, to analyze beer residue she's brought from Amarna. It can magnify up to 50,000 times. Fragments invisible to the naked eye are so enlarged they become treasure troves, rich in information Delwyn can interpret. As a result of using SEM, I've found out a whole lot of different information that really wasn't known at all before. And it's through using SEM that new insights have been gained. And really the key new understanding about beer is that it's a lot more complicated and a lot more sophisticated than anybody really has given the ancient Egyptians credit for. The breakthrough has really been that there were two separate processes used in beer brewing and that's something that nobody had any idea about before. And what I've been able to establish is that there were two batches of grain which were treated in different ways and then mixed to make the beer. But in fact, the kind of work that I'm doing means that I need the expertise of people who are used to working with brewing and with baking. And I can get so far with the residues that I have and understand them in their archaeological context. But in order to understand the technological processes, it's really invaluable to have people who, who do this work regularly. And so the, the work that comes together is on the one hand, the archaeologists who understand. Yes. That technological expertise is found in Scottish and Newcastle's experimental brew house in Edinburgh. It's taken four years to come this far. The emma wheat grown in Cambridge has produced a good yield, and calcium has been added to Edinburgh water to match the Egyptian sample. The residues have yielded their secrets, and Nefertiti's beer is being brewed again. We've had a tremendous jigsaw to piece together, and we've still got the final pieces to go in there, but it's taken quite a considerable uh, period of time. We've had to combine archaeology, we've had to combine uh, archaeobotany, and we've had to combine the brewing process in, in all of that. And it's been quite a haul, but we shall get there. It is quite a remarkable exercise. And in fact, it's you know, created interest throughout the world. This has been a, a journey of exploration, really, not knowing at each stage what's going to happen, what will work, what won't work. So it has been the opposite way around to normal product development. Some of the yeast out of this one. Into this one. The only significant deviation is that there's work which is probably going to go on over the next few years, looking at yeast to try and identify exactly what strain of yeast was used. We've looked around, we found a yeast that ferments the beer in a couple of days, and we feel confident that's close to the yeast the Egyptians would have been using. It's difficult as a scientist to, to prove because we've got no one who can taste it. But I'm convinced that uh, if we could go back in time, we'd have a product that the Egyptians would recognize as one of their types of beer. What I've done is I've produced four types of beer, one which is the base beer, one with coriander, one with the nabac, and one with both coriander and nabac. Senep. Senep. Health. Here goes. It's quite sweet. Mm. Quite sweet, quite grainy. None of the bitterness you'd normally find in a beer. No. no. It tastes that different. Well, I think it's quite pleasant. And I thought, as I was working on the residues and so on, that it could be quite a pleasant taste. And sure enough, it's really very drinkable. Hmm, that's good. It's got a good, clean taste. Yep. I think it'd be interesting to try the ones with some herbs added to them as well, see how that develops the flavour. I think it's different in that it doesn't possess the modern characteristics of beer, in that it doesn't have any 
hoppiness to it. Mm. There's no bitterness to that's it. That's the big difference. So that's slightly, that's somewhat different to, to modern beers. And of course, it's a wheat beer as well, as opposed to a, a barley base beer. And that's totally different. And I think when uh, you find that this has been refined somewhat, and possibly some nabag or coriander, and you're really going to get into quite a nice product. The experiment has been a success, and academic research back through time for the earliest beer could lead to a new commercial brew. We didn't set out for this to be a commercial product, but the interest it has created indicates that practically everybody everywhere would like to have a taste of this. And so we're going to think seriously about how we can at least produce a limited quantity of the, of the beer. And uh, we have said, of course, that if we do this and it goes on sale, then we will uh, assist the Egypt Exploration Society financially from those sales to help further excavation work. For the foreseeable future, it's unlikely that anyone will taste the recreated beer back in Egypt. This is a predominantly Muslim country where alcohol is forbidden on religious grounds. Anyone caught selling beer without special permission can suffer heavy fines or imprisonment. So the future of Nefertiti's beer in its country of origin truly is in the hands of the gods.